שלום וברכה, חברים שלי, peace and blessing, my friends. I welcome you to this lesson, uh, Monday School. We are launching into a new quarter, and our study this quarter is going to be in the Book of Romans. Uh, the, one of the greatest documents found within our scriptures. The Book of Romans has probably been responsible for more revivals, uh, and, and especially uh, of, of special importance to those who are of a Wesleyan persuasion. It was while John Wesley heard a Moravian pastor reading from Luther's introduction to the Book of Romans that he reported his heart being strangely warmed, the, what is called the Aldersgate experience, that he was at that church on Aldersgate Street, and uh, it was about nine in the evening, uh, late church, but uh, that was the beginning of John Wesley's walk of faith. He had been in, attempting to please God, had felt himself an utter failure, and then discovered faith in Christ. So as we open the book of Romans, as we begin to study here, I invite you to come and uh, rejoice with me in this um, study of what many consider to be the, the greatest of Paul's writings. Join me in prayer, will you? Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us of your Son. You sent your Son into this world to save sinners. And of that we are thankful, that there is nothing that any of us can do to keep you from loving us. Neither is there anything we can do to earn salvation, that salvation is found by grace through faith. And so we ask now that as we study this word, for those of us who walk in faith, that our faith would be strengthened. And for those of, of us who have not yet found that faith, that we may find it. Help us. We pray in the blessed name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to be reading, first of all, the, the verses 1 through 15 of chapter 1 of Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who, through the, fa through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentile, Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit, 
in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. It was likely in 57 or 58 AD, give or take a year, that the Apostle Paul, likely from Corinth, wrote this letter to the church in Rome. And we'll talk a little more about the composition of that church, who they are and, and how they think as we move into this. But I just wanted to give that sort of, of framework, and we may fill some of that in in the weeks to come. But Paul refers to himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, and the word there for servant is doulos, which correctly understood is slave. There are some modern translations that say bond servant. But the reality is, um, even though uh, the Jews understood what it was to be a, quote, bond servant, that that was not common language. And uh, there are some who say that it, it didn't even exist as a, as a word, uh, as a way of interpreting doulos. Uh, that slave is, is closer to the idea. Now, not slavery in the, the American tradition, uh, but certainly slavery as they understood it in the time of Christ, that there were those who, for whatever reasons, found themselves with a debt that they could not pay and... Uh, that they were, for that reason, attached to a master for some period of time. I think where the bond servant idea comes in, there's a place in the Torah that talks about uh, if, if a slave does not want to leave his master, that he can become a, a permanent servant, if you will, uh, that he can make his slavery permanent by having his master uh, take an awl and drive it through his earlobe uh, up against the doorframe, uh, presumably not leaving you there, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I just had to do that. Anyway, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. He is linked permanently to Jesus. And that he was called to be an apostle. So the reason why he's an apostle is not his idea. This is not something that he cooked up. Neither is it something that the other apostles came up with that Paul is an apostle by the ba on the basis of God's call. And uh, as, as we know, that call was first placed on him on the road to Damascus when he was struck down 
and spoken to in a vision that others heard but didn't see and, and didn't hear all of the words that were going on. But afterwards, Paul was blind, was taken into Damascus, where his sight was restored by a follower of Christ named Ananias, and Paul was baptized, and from that day began declaring that salvation is found in none other than in Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. Um, so, uh, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel, so being set apart, uh, we, we understand that. That is some of the language that, that we sometimes use in our theological position, speaking about sanctification, that being sanctified is to be set apart uh, for God's purposes, that regardless of what your occupation is, that if you belong to him, you have been set apart for the gospel. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Again, this is not something that anybody came up with lately. This was something that God had set forth in his word through the Holy Prophets uh, regarding his son, who, speaking of Jesus, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David. He was a blood descendant through Mary's line of King David. And who, through the spirit of holiness, then and understand that uh, here Paul is starting to bring in the picture of the Trinity. God the Father has appointed the Son who has been endorsed by the Spirit. And we this is not the first place that we see this in the Scriptures, although chronologically it may be one of the first places where we see it. That uh, by the through the Spirit of holiness, Jesus was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. And when it says appointed, that more pointed to as the, the Son of God. Uh, it's not an appointment like we would say somebody was uh, appointed a temporary political office or something like that. This is uh, that he is designated the Son of God by the resurrection. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death. All are deserving of death. He alone embraced death for the purpose of being the only sacrifice that could ever take away sin and as a result his resurrection says he is Lord now through him verse 5 we received so Paul has not only been called and been set apart, but he has received grace. In other words, he's saying, I, I am not carrying around the load that I once carried. I do not any longer stand guilty before Christ of the crimes that I committed against his church. Why? Because he has received grace. But he's not alone in that. 
He doesn't say, I have received grace. He says, we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Obedience and faith. These two are linked. That you declare your faith but walk in disobedience and you are a walking, talking contradiction. That uh, your life is the spiritual equivalent of an oxymoron. You know, like jumbo shrimp. Is it little or is it big? Tell me. That's an oxymoron. And you don't want to be a spiritual version of that. A disobedient Christian. It's not to say that you can't be disobedient, but that is not considered the normal Christian life. And yes, there is such thing as being normal in this life. We live in a society that wants to tell you that anything you want to be normal is normal. No. Normal is that which, which can be expected and should be expected of an individual who is, is in a particular relationship. It is normal for husbands and wives, the husband being a man, the wife being a woman, to be uh, bound together for life, for life, in a loving relationship with one another Nobody else gets inside that bond. Okay? So, we are called to call, or Paul is called to call the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Obedience comes from faith. Verse 6, And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, when he says you, he is speaking to the church, the church in Rome. Now, to all in Rome who are loved by God, and called to be his holy people. Why do you suppose Paul uses the language that he does here that he does not refer to them as the church in Rome, where in other letters he begins by speaking to them as, uh, for instance, in Thessalonica, he says, the church of the Thessalonians or the church of God that is in Thess Thessalonica, excuse me. That's, he calls it the church of God in Thessalonica. In Corinth, he calls it the church of Corinth. And the reason that he appears to do that is because the, that church is so far off the mark that he doesn't want to call it God's church yet. It should be God's, but they're so busy running it like they want it run that it's something other. We don't want to be something other than the church but one of the reasons that he appears 
to say to all in Rome who are loved by God that in Rome, the church was at this time house churches. There was no major single gathering place. Uh, it, it's, it's likely from his greeting at the end of the letter that there are five different groups who are being addressed. So uh, this may be another reason why he doesn't say the church in Rome. He wants to be sure that each congregation understands himself to be included. And he's saying all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. So God's call to holiness is upon all the, the believers who are in Rome in all five locations. That's exciting, isn't it? And it's amazing to think how many churches there are now, but so many in which the people have low expectations of what they are called to be. They excuse sin with phrases like, I'm only human. You are human. But you are not only human. You're a human being who has called to be one of his holy people. If you're looking for something to pray for, that is a good one. Make me, O oh Lord, one of your holy people people. Guide and direct my steps that I may be one of your holy people. And I'm not trying to do this for the sake of window dressing. I'm not trying to be a working model. I'm not trying to point to myself and say, you ought to be like this. But what I am saying is that the holiness of that God intends can reside within every individual who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome, second half of verse 7, grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord. Jesus Christ. This is a benediction. Good words. Even as he's getting started, this pronouncement of blessing. And it's so um, uh, that, that he is, is saying, grace and peace to you. That as uh, the Jews begin their study of Torah, that in Hebrew they recite, Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu Melech Olam, and it goes on from there. But, but blessed be. That's the Baruch Baruch Ata. Blessed are you, um, Adonai Eloheinu. The Lord our God, Melech HaOlam, the King of creation, the King of the universe. And so Paul is saying, because of what Christ has done, it is appropriate for grace and peace to be pronounced upon you, understanding that that grace and peace comes from God the Father, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, first I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. When we walk in the light as he is in the light and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin, 
Not only are we set free from sin, but it's visible to others. There's a difference because of what Christ has done. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers. We are to be a praying people, praying for one another as well as for the lost world around us. Skipping down to verse 11, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. And, and this is exciting, and at the same time, there's a little bit of humor here, I see it as humor, that he's saying, I've got something that can straighten you out. And then, in verse 12, he says, that is, you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So he says, this is not just a top-down thing. It's not, hey, listen up, because I'm going to straighten you out. He is saying, we have that which God has done in us that can knit us even closer together than we already are, that can make us more the one unified body of Christ that we so desire to be that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented so far from coming, from doing that. In order, and why does he want to come? Not just because he wants to travel, not just for geographical reasons, not so that he can try and put his his, uh, a, another check mark next to a list of accomplishments, it's that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Paul knows that his ministry has been effective and he wants it to keep going. And Rome is an ideal place for this to happen. It's the capital city of Rome. The city of Rome is, is the, the center from which the entire Roman, uh, Roman world is controlled. That the government and the way that things are administered, that God is using this, the, the Roman roads and the Peace, uh, what, what, what the historians call the Pax Romana, the peace that is imposed by Rome that opens the way for the church to spread throughout the Roman world. And he says, I am obligated both. By the way, I, I think I sort of skipped over this. One of the things that's also going on, and we'll see this more as we see the content of the entire book, but the Roman church is both Gentile and Jew. That there are Jewish believers and Gentile believers, they're all part of the same church, and because of the potential misunderstanding associated with um, the theological positions that would be known to the Jews in one quarter and a brand new discovery by the Gentiles in another that it's possible for there to be factions to develop. And so Paul is laying out a theological framework for the entire church so that all can understand and embrace the truth of Jesus Christ without allowing other things to distract and enter in and create internal division. But he says, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, and I think literally that's barbarians, 
both to the wise and the foolish, the educated and the uneducated. That's why I am so eager to pe preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. So Paul wants to get this message across to them. Now, the lesson um, uh, authors have chosen at this point to fast forward to the 15th chapter of Romans. And starting with verse 18, we read, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. Paul is saying, if anything has been accomplished in the things that I have done from a ministry standpoint, they have been accomplished by Christ, who has chosen to work through me, and that if there have been any powers or signs, signs of wonders that have happened, their point is not to say, isn't Paul magnificent? It is to say, to God be the glory. Jesus Christ has made a difference in this world, and he can make a difference in you. So, from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Paul is saying, I want to declare the truth so that those who hear can start building on a solid foundation instead of me having to come in and tear out that which has been done by error. I don't know if you've ever lived in a house that was put together by somebody who didn't know exactly what they were doing. And uh, everything seems to be right until you start to, for instance, go up the stairs and discover that the treads are a little too far apart. Or maybe some of them are too far apart, and as you get closer to the bottom, they're a little too close together. That can be a problem. And Paul is saying, I want to build it right from the start. And skipping down to verse 23, but now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. Now, it's, it's our understanding that, that Paul was about 20 plus years at this point, probably about 20 years into his ministry. And uh, he had been through a lot. But he's basically saying, I'm not done yet, and I've got big plans. It's my understanding that when John Wesley died at the age of 89, he had a three-year slate of speaking engagements that he had already planned uh, to, to, they were already on his calendar. That was his intention, that... Uh, he had at least another three years of ministry to go in his mind uh, that Paul wanted to go. He says, I hope to see you while passing through. <laughs> I love it. He's on his way to Spain, but I'll stop by Rome and see how you're doing. And to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Paul loves the, the believers in Rome, uh, the church in Rome, even if it is under five different roofs, that Paul loves the church and has given himself totally 
to declaring the gospel that can set men and women free to walk in the Spirit of Christ by the power of Christ within. Oh Lord, would you make that a reality in our lives? Help us in the here and now to be those who are looking out toward the horizon and dreaming the dream that we can make a difference in a world that is becoming increasingly um, disenchanted with the church because they're ignorant of what you have called the church to do and to be. By the Spirit of Christ, would you help us make a difference here and now to the glory of God the Father and His blessed Son through the power of His Holy Spirit. Amen.